Hello and welcome to the Hub on CGTN. I'm Meng Guan in Beijing. This year marked the 10th anniversary of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Now, so much talk has been focused on the graining of the BRI or BRI 2.0. How is that happening? The BRI International Grain Development Coalition or BRIGC convenes a meeting in Beijing recently to discuss just that. On the sidelines of the meeting, we caught up with Eric Soheim, the convener of the BRIGC and also the former Undersecretary General of the United Nations. We began our conversation with his recent trip to Shandong, my hometown. Eric, welcome back to China. It has been years. I came once during COVID and spent two weeks in quarantine with a beautiful view of Shanghai River. Uh, but of course, as most Chinese, I'm very happy that COVID is passed and that we can now go back and travel everywhere without any restrictions. It's so nice. You know, Eric, uh, recently you got quite famous because of videos of you taking a bullet train, of course, and then arriving at none other than my hometown, uh, Shandong, Zibo in particular, where the, the barbecue, the kebabs there uh, were so famous. What was it like? Uh, absolutely wonderful. I mean, very tasteful and so many young people. I mean, thousands upon thousands of young people coming to Cebu and we can have this very tasty fun, absolutely clean, very nice, uh, very, very tasteful and very nice. I can recommend everyone, please go to Cebu or make your own barbecue in very, whatever city. Um, Eric, let's talk about the session mm -hmm. that just happened, uh, the round table on the graining of the BRI. What are the latest uh, regarding the progress of the graining of the BRI? Uh, there is now enormous optimism, uh, particularly because when President Xi Jinping decided that China would stop all overseas coal investment, it had immediate impact. And coal investment, of course, came down, but also the desire from everyone to ask China, please come and help us with solar, with wind, high-speed rail, electric buses, all the alternative techno technologies. That desire is now so strong. So we see Belt and Road and this green Belt and Road coalition as a main vehicle to provide Chinese investment, Chinese technology, and also exchange of use between China and the world on the green developments. What are some of the success stories? I lived for some years in Kenya. If you travel through the city of Mombasa, mm -hmm. frankly, that's a quite poor and somewhat run-down city. So it's not really inspiring you traveling through the city. But then, wow, <laughs> you come to the Nairobi, Mombasa railroad, the rail station is completely green, everything is well functioning, it's completely clean, it's a completely new world, and of course it shows the people of Kenya the future uh, and how much Chinese investment can bring to Kenya. And this railroad is done with a lot of attention to nature that bypasses so that elephants and other uh, uh, animals can pass under or over uh, the railroad. In what ways do you envision and do you see the BRI in helping bring about or consolidating multilateralism? It should be a people's silk road, meaning that it's not, not just be government, not just be business, but also the exchange of ideas. Because while China today probably have more to teach the world uh, on environment than to learn, but still it should be a mutual exchange uh, of, of, uh, of uh, views. I mean, if China relates to Africa or to Latin America, there is a lot to learn uh, both ways. Say Brazil is a key, key nation. Uh, Brazil, is with, with, under President Lula, will now bring down deforestation in Brazil in a fantastic way. Indonesia has just brought deforestation to zero. Here there are lessons learned, which the rest of the world can benefit from. So the, the Silk Road or Belt and Road should not just be learning from Chinese experiences, but as much learning from, say, Indonesian or Brazilian or whatever nation's experiences. And do you think BRI is a concrete case in point uh, whereby uh, China is demonstrating to the world that uh, its global development initiative, for example, is not just a lofty slogan? No, no, Belt and Road is by far the biggest investment scheme in our era with enormous benefit from, men, from many developing countries. I mean, I mentioned a few, the Laos Railroad or the Mombasa Railroad in, in Africa and so, so, so many others. So yes, this is practicing the words of multilateralism in the 21st century. And the West should not criticize, the West should try to do better. Because what would African nations love to see? They want investment from China and from the United States or Europe. <laughs> they want people to people's contact to China and to the United States. And they want to send their bright young students, yes, to Tsinghua or 
<laughs> or to Peking University, but I also want to send them to Harvard uh, or, or Yale. So let's not see this as a competition between China and the West, but uh, as an area where we can have so much to cooperate about. Talking about that, do you think allegations uh, alleged against the BRI of it being uh, neocolonialism and that trap is, um, by and large, far-fetched? That's basically anti-Chinese propaganda, which can com completely be dismissed. I can give you one example. I'm, I'm advisor to the president of, of Sri Lanka, Ranil Vikramasinghe, and he has now the enormous task of restoring his nation after the complete uh, melting down of the economy last year. And some has then finger pointed to China <laughs> for this collapse. But look, 8% of Sri Lankan debt is to China. There's also debt to India, but most of the debt is to the West. And now both, the, both President Xi of China, Prime Minister Modi of India, and the Western institution, they have all made an agreement with Sri Lanka to restructure the debt. So why, why finger point to China when there is more debt to the West? And overall, of course, developing nations have a lot more debt to the West than they do have to China. But the future, uh, the future leaning policy has to look into how we can jointly help these nations to restructure the debt and come out of, 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 of these difficulties. Eric, you have been serving as Norway's Minister of the Environment and International Development. And during your tenure, Norway spent 1% of its gross domestic uh, income as official development assistance, the highest in the world. Um, why did you decide to do that? We decided to do that because Norway is a very rich nation which can afford to help nations which have been more uh, unlucky in, in history. The one thing I was most proud of as Norwegian minister was to start the global campaign for the conservation of rainforests, the so-called Red Plus program. Uh, that we partnered with Brazil, with Indonesia, and with a number of other nations to bring down deforestation. And of course, Brazil and Indonesia did the job by their policies and their business, but we helped with, with, with Norwegian support for this. Um, it has been amazingly successful. Last year, Indonesia brought deforestation down to zero, not one. Uh, as Norway's uh, Minister of the International Development and Environment, also there was this Nature Diversity Act that has been enforced. Uh, some call it uh, Norway's most important piece of environmental legislation in the last 100 years. Um, tell us a bit about that. That is, in fact, quite similar to what in China is called the Red Line System. That's about how can you protect nature where it's really difficult. What is easy for Norway and pretty easy for China is to protect the nature up in the mountains where there are very few people are living. For China to protect some mountains in the Himalayas or some desert in Xinjiang may not be that challenging. What's very, very difficult is to protect nature in the Pearl River Delta or in the Yangtze Valley, which is an enormous population. Same we were facing in Norway, how to protect nature in our city and where people are living. So we made specific protection for, 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 for these areas. For example, if you want to make a new habitat or a new road, you are obliged to look into what impact it has on nature. When you do it, it should be done with utmost uh, attention to the ne potential negative impact on nature. Maybe you should put the road in another place if that's better for nature. Or if you cannot do that, make sure that, say, animals can pass the road without being, being destroyed by the road. All right. And you have said, and I quote, if we all come together and work together, there's no limit to what we can achieve on planet Earth. Um, some people would argue that uh, it sounds a bit uh, airy-fairy. What will be the priorities and how to go about achieving these goals that you've just stated? I don't think this is uh, airy-fairy. When 3,000 years ago, the old Indians said, the whole universe is one family. Uh, I think this is a deep insight. It was true 3,000 years ago, but it's true today also. Look to all major issues over time. If you want to create peace on the, in the world, well, it's much easier if the main powers say the United States and China work together. If you want to restart the economy after COVID, again, we can do a lot more together than separate it. If you want to prevent a new massive uh, pandemic, well, we need to prepare vaccines for that to happen. Uh, then we can do it much better together. What, uh, and of course, climate change and environment, we cannot solve these, these issues separately. So whatever is the issue, 
the two main powers of our era, China and the United States, should work more closely together. But they should work with the, let's call it, secondary powers like India, Europe, Brazil, South Africa, Turkey and others in a multipolar world where we all respect each other. And in my view, the most important word is the word respect. Because there is no way we will adopt each other's systems. I mean, China will not adopt the American system, but nor will America adopt the Chinese system. Exactly. Talking about China and the United States, it seems that uh, a vicious cycle is very easily kicked in. You know, one side accusing the other and tit for tat. But how about a, a virtuous cycle that many experts are calling on the United States and China uh, to building? Because after all, so much is at stake, as you said, only if China and the United, S United States can work together. How can the two sides really kick in or usher in a, a virtuous cycle to improve relations, in your opinion? Uh, we should reward all those people in politics or business or academics who call for a better understanding to try to understand each other, all those in the West to try to learn more about the enormous enormity of Chinese achievements, but also in China to understand, say, the United States better. When I hear my American friends bashing China, I tell them, but look, <laughs> these nations have brought more people out of poverty than any other nation uh, in history at a shorter time. And this nation, China, has a 10 times longer history than you have in the United States. Please look for the fantastic achievements of China. But if some of my Chinese friends are speaking negatively about uh, the United States, I tell them, look, this is the nation of George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. This is the nation that has been the leader of the scientific revolution in the world in the last decades. Look for the goods in America, not just for the bad. So let's avoid all the peacemakers rather than those who create tensions. Uh, finally, I want to get your take on the global economy. The IMF has uh, downcasted the, the forecast of global economic growth to less than 3%. Also, China's economy is growing, but uh, is under uh, tremendous stress uh, from many sectors and throughout uh, many industries. Uh, what's your you know, prediction and uh, forecast to the Chinese economy as well as the glo global economy going forward? What should be the new engines? Nearly all economic growth in the world this year is expected to come in Asia. China, India, Vietnam, Indonesia and a number of other nations. So this is really the growth engine of the world. The good news is of course that this is now more and more green growth. And <coughs> the, f the future growth will come in the green industries. And China and India has understood this better than anyone else. Look, China didn't have a traditional brand for cars. There is no Chinese Toyota. Toyota is known everywhere on planet Earth. People know Toyota. What did China do? Leapfrog into electric vehicles. And this year, BYD will be the biggest producer of electric vehicles in the entire world. That's smart industrial policy added. It's of course good for, for the environment. So these this smart, I will say, green economic policies of both President Xi of China, Prime Minister Modi of India, and many other Asian leaders, that's what will drive uh, the green shift, but it's also what will drive the economic growth of the, uh, uh, of the world in uh, the next decade. Development versus the environment. Can the two forge a mutually reinforcing relationship going forward? In light of global geopolitical tensions and the economic headwinds, do policymakers around the world still have enough political capital to implement their green strategies? Recently, I caught up with Marco Lambertini, the former director general of the WWF International, and currently he is the co-chair of the BRIGC. Listen to our conversation. So, Marco, welcome back to China after what? How many years? Almost four. Incredible. Almost four years. Yes. How do you feel? I love China and, uh, and I love these gatherings because uh, they offer the opportunity to really talk openly about big global issues and the role of China in addressing and helping address those global issues. So, I love to be back. So, what do you think have come out of this morning's roundtable with your colleagues from the Ministry of Ecology and the Environment and also colleagues from around the world? A reaffirmation of the need for our society and economy to really begin to transition from what we could define in the shorthand from a nature negative society, society that has developed at the expenses of nature and the environment, to a nature positive economy.
an economy that actually develops uh, uh, using nature as an ally and preserving nature in the meantime. And so sustainable development, in other words, uh, and the role that a large <coughs> initiative like the Belt and Road Initiative could play in helping this transition towards a sustainable nature positive future. Yeah, definitely. There's a Chinese proverb uh, dating back from, I think, uh, 1,000 or 2,000 years ago saying <coughs> precisely this point uh, that, um, you know, fish, fish are good fish, but don't exhaust, um, you know, all the fish in a pool. Otherwise, uh, they would be in trouble. Marco, tell us a bit about the BRIGC. Uh, what is this organization all about and what is it doing now? So this has been obviously an initiative already existing, uh, 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 launched and supported by President Xi at the time of the launch of the BRI. So there was already, <coughs> as part of this uh, uh, Chinese concept of ecological civilization, there, is a, there was already a commitment to make the, B, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, green, as green as possible uh, from the beginning. But now that commitment is even stronger because it's not just about making the BRI green, it's actually about making the BRI contributing to a global green agenda. And then there is the linear infrastructure, which is roads, uh, railways, which are actually having an impact on nature, on natural habitats, on biodiversity. And, uh, and there is a great opportunity here to make sure that actually, by not just looking at, the imp uh, at mitigating the impact of the road, but looking at the implications of the road for the whole landscape, we can actually not only mitigate the impact of the routing of the infrastructure, but actually we can contribute to the conservation the protection, sustainable development of the entire region where the infrastructure is based. And so, again, a, a net positive outcome, not just uh, uh, limit the damage, but actually do good, contribute to a larger conservation of nature agenda. Yeah. There's something very interesting that we're paying attention to, that is green technology exchange and transfer uh, that is considered crucial in uh, delivering uh, the promises of the green BRI um, do we have any uh, specifics regarding the green technologies exchange and transfer and uh, how are they uh, progressing along the way? Absolutely. I, I mean, technology obviously, <coughs> it, let me say, technology is one part of the solution. Actually, perhaps before technology, you need to actually see the cultural shift that allows to really prioritize the technology for a sustainable development purpose. You know, our history, uh, our relationship with technology is quite uh, mixed. <laughs> Very often we come up with well, great yeah, technology, yeah. but we don't consider the side effects. I mean, combustion yeah, engine, yeah, the typical was. example, was the, the great revolution of industrialization in, in the, you know, a century ago. And then here we go, with climate change as a consequence of it. So, um, so there is the, uh, technology needs to be embraced within a cultural context of clear directions on uh, decarbonization, and conservation of nature. But there is no doubt that technology transfer and innovation in technology is a big component of the answer to, to sustainability. On energy, is obvious. Uh, we have now the technology, thanks honestly to the major investment of China in uh, solar and wind uh, uh, years ago, and now clashing the price, which is making renewable energy truly competitive with fossil fuel, in fact, much more smart and, and, effect and effective. So, in that sense, boosting renewable energy, transfer of that technology, and the newcomer uh, on hydrogen and, and, and other sources of renewable energy, clean energy, it's, um, it's the way. When it comes to nature, it's about uh, new technology in how you will exploit forests, uh, uh, rivers, and, and ocean, uh, or resources in a way that is sustainable. So, there are plenty of room for innovation, but, as I said earlier, we need to see financing, public and private, shifting to support that innovation. There's still 1.8, 1.5, 1 1.8 $1 trillion dollars spent by in, in, in the shape of public subsidies that actually are still going in supporting the old model. Fossil fuel, chemical agriculture, uh, uh, intensive fishing, etc., etc. That needs to shift. If you don't make that shift, innovation will remain niche and it won't become mainstream. Yeah, the, there are a lot of um, conspiracy theorists out there, you know, doubting the, um, you know, the theory of climate change. Uh, we've seen quite a bit in 2016, uh, where I was in Washington covering the, 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 the political campaign trails there. Um, Marco, how would you assess the role of China uh, in not only the greening of the Chinese economy, but also uh, in assuming this global 
uh, green leadership role, if you will? Well, I mean, China is in an absolutely fantastic position to lead uh, this transition, or to help lead, contribute to, to, to this transition in a significant way. First of all, uh, you are uh, at the epicenter of the global economy uh, as, a, as a major manufacturing uh, and, uh, and, and more uh, uh, country. Uh, uh, so, you know, the decision that you take uh, have repercussions globally, I inevitably, through the supply chains uh, you are part of. Um, secondly, you uh, also are geopolitically in a position that is close to the developing world. Uh, uh, you're seen as a, as, a, as, a, as a peer of many developing countries. Uh, and so you're in a position to forge a very different uh, relationship narrative discussion than perhaps the North and the West is uh, in some cases. Uh, and uh, I think China uh, has demonstrated by scaling up first domestically and then uh, internationally, uh, for example, renewable energy technology, that you can do that in so many other fields. Uh, one thing which is one of my uh, <laughs> uh, dreams is that China could, could repeat that incredible contribution to the world, a gift to the world of, of uh, uh, reducing the cost of renewable energy in the field of uh, biodegradable plastic, polymers. Plastic is another big issue that we're facing today. It's increasingly uh, dangerous, we understand increasingly dangerous, for human health as well as for ecosystem and uh, environment. And so imagine if China could uh, 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 develop a technology that really come up with polymers which are truly highly biodegradable, and uh, which are now already there almost, but need the investment to be scaled up, crash the price, the world will be ready like it was with solar panels to embrace it. So China's got plenty of opportunities because you have the economy, the size of the country, uh, and the, uh, your position in global supply chains. And yeah, we've been talking to some colleagues at the WTO and then treating the, mm -hmm. the plastic, the plastic. Right. Uh, industry, you know, overhauling the, the, the plastic industry and adopting more biodegradable stuff is uh, w you know, something very high on their agenda. Well, look, there is a clear parallel. Uh, we are phasing out fossil fuel uh, with renewable energy in terms of energy production. We should phase out fossil fuel-based plastic and move to a different type of polymers, which are much more sustainable and biodegradable. Coming back to the topic of the green BRI, I know there's such a thing as uh, a traffic light system uh, to rank BRI projects as green, less green, not green at all. Uh, tell us a bit about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, this was a very courageous, uh, bold uh, uh, decision of, of, of BRI uh, Green Coalition because for the first time injected a, a, a mechanism of scrutiny and, and assessment in a very simple way as well, so it was easy, easy to communicate, to understand, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the impacts, the, in the level of impact of, of projects uh, within the system. Uh, now what we need to see, so that's great, and, and, and has been already increasing visibility, transparency and all the rest. What needs to happen now is to refine the traffic light, uh, including also now the new goals about nature and, and uh, that have been approved uh, and agreed recently, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but also uh, then have a mechanism to intervene uh, with incentives and disincentives, cost of capital and all the rest that would actually help uh, push the green project and stop the red ones. Yeah. Marco, you have been in uh, conservation industry, actually you have exercised the conservation leadership for 35 years, right? Uh, through WWF. Unfortunately, on one hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that, that, that's, um, that's a very valuable experience that you can share with some of our audience maybe on how exactly did you change attitudes and practices when it comes to conservation? Um, what were the challenges and maybe some of the highlights that uh, you're very content with? Oh, I mean, this would be an interview on its own <laughs> in 35 <laughs> years. But uh, li listen, I, I actually, when I speak to young people in particular, because there is a problem actually, we're facing a problem, a serious problem these days, and many polls are, are highlighting that. A lot of young people are feeling very anxious about the future very anxious and one of the key reasons for their anxiety is actually environment the bad state of the environment that they envisage for the future and the consequences of that so for me that has been the biggest uh, uh, change over the last uh, few decades in the way we perceive nature nature 
distraction, nature, loss, extinction, all the issues, pollution, is not any longer just something people are outraged about or sad about. People are actually worried. And that creates uh, a completely different attitude to the issue. The moral argument that we've been actually, an organization like WF, we, we are born about moral argument, our duty to coexist with the rest of nature is still very strong. For me, it's super strong for many of us, for many people, but hasn't really managed to change the system and the behaviors the way we want it. When the issue of nature conservation becomes actually material, personal, touches your life, your economy, your health, then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> things it's are taken yeah. more seriously. And that's what I've seen exactly over the last few decades. Nature was taken for granted, was loved, but taken for granted. Now nature is a concern, and it's something that we understand. In fact, we understand we depend on nature, frankly, much more than nature depends on us. We aren't going to be the one paying the price, our children. The moral, the moral duty is not on any, any longer about, only about tigers and elephants and whales. So they, have, they have the right to have a space on the planet. It's also about our children. And that makes the argument much more universal and compelling. Very well said. Um, finally, we're marking the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative, something that has been conceived in Astana, Kazakhstan, 10 years ago by the Chinese president there, giving a speech to an audience in Central Asia. 10 years on, uh, there are debates about the merits of this project. I guess the jury <laughs> might, might still be out. But what do you think of this project 10 years on? The jury is still out, of course, uh, but le let's remember, uh, the project is nested in the current economic development model. It's not, uh, it's not broken free from, from that yet. And so, for sure, any infrastructure project to this day, it's still having a, a, an unacceptable impact on the environment. But we're seeing movement and progress in the right direction. That's what really, that's what we really, really need to focus on and to accelerate that transition. And that's what the initiative that we are launching today, uh, the second phase, in fact, of the bre uh, Greening of the Belt Road Initiative, is, uh, is, is all about. It's about now, now that we know what we need to do, now we need to apply in the design phase, implementation phase of infrastructure investment projects and, and deliver uh, the outcome that we want. Positive for, for the economy and the growth, uh, positive for the environment, uh, and, uh, and, and social development. And I think all this is, um, is, is, is possible. Um, and I can tell for sure that the commitment, the political commitment behind this is, is very strong. That's why we have agreed to join this initiative. Marco, so good to see you back in China. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of The Hub on CGTN. Our news coverage continues. Bye. Take care.